Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alter History Podcast. Don sitting in the driver's chair today for the Wayback Machine. By the way, we are going to create at least some type of T-shirt inside of our Inspired By store for the Wayback Machine. I just don't know what it's going to look like yet, but I got some ideas that we're putting together there. So for the, those of you that have either been to our uh, been to our online store, please do that uh, just to check out what's already there. But also look for, we keep referencing the Wayback Machine or the, you know, the the, the alternate history machine that Electros and I used so often in early episodes. We're going to have a graphic of that eventually. Just stay in tune for that. But that is not the purpose of today's episode. The purpose of today's episode is for me to be joined by Robert Koshi. Robert, how are you doing this evening? Good, good. And also by Chris Capola, who probably should say hello to the good people. Hello to the good people. There we go. Now it's a fork in time episode. And we're going to do something. I don't know where to classify this one, guys. This is not a topic that we've had long standing in the queue. You know, so sometimes we've been thinking about some of these things for a while. This one sort of, uh, this one cut in line, so to speak. By the way, I think cutting in line is a very Southern aphorism that I've heard skipping being used to describe it by other people. There's a whole thing about just the language of how you cheat the queue. Uh, that, you know, we use different terms throughout that, but this one's sort of cut ahead of others in line. And uh, I think it's going to cross the line between what we sometimes call a whimsy episode to a degree. Uh, if for no other reason, just the story that we're going to use to launch off with the fork here. But then it's also one of those things that has maybe deeper legs than you think about that. As we were talking off podcast, sort of getting ready here, uh, there's more implication to this than what you might imagine. And I'll explain my thoughts on this as we go through and some of the others that the team has brought up. But what we're going to do today is imagine a scenario where you see a locomotive and the locomotive that's going down the track. And even modern locomotives today have something to this effect. They normally have something on the front of the engine, the front of the train, which is designed to make sure that if there is debris on the track or if there's an animal or something else that that gets on the track, it's diverted away from being pulled up underneath the actual uh, train the engine itself and underneath the train and the term that's normally used to describe this if you think about the classic in image of a locomotive is this sort of pointed thing on the lower front that's got a downward plane at a point on the end and the term that's often used to describe it is cow catcher and so in front of the pl- in front of the train on the engine there is this this construction that's at the front if you will the uh the the uh the front prow of the train that's designed to sweep anything that it might encounter on the track off of the track and obviously with the name with cow catcher the thinking there is that might be livestock but you know it could be anything that's there debris whatever the case might be so apparently as i've come to discover here one thomas alva edison yes the thomas alva edison of inventor fame the wizard of menlo park uh when in doubt, when there was a question about invention during in history in school, you probably guessed Edison if you didn't know better, because at least you felt like you had a fighting chance by guessing Edison about whatever that invention might be. That this one, Thomas Alva Edison, that we know so well from American history and sort of American practical science application, was apparently quite the train aficionado. And thus would been, would befriend engineers when he had the opportunity to travel on train. We're still in that era of train travel in the late 19th century being the norm. And he apparently more than once convinced the engineers of the train that the place he would like to ride is not in a passenger car. Maybe not even in the actual, you know, engine itself with the engineer, but he wanted a little cushion and he liked to sit out on the, on the cow catcher, on the, if you will, the prow of the train as it flew along at, the closest thing to speed that they knew at that time, pre-automobile, pre-airplane, this was this was about as close as you were going to get to your uh, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio moment from Titanic and be, quote unquote, king of the world, if that makes any sense. And that all sounds well and good until something happens. And supposedly, at least on one of these little excursions in his early 30s, Uh, Edison later relates the story of having done this frequently to someone who's writing about him and says that, yes, there was a close call once when the train hit a small animal of some type, which whizzed by his head 
and theoretically could have hit him or knocked him off of the front of the train moving at the speed that it was. Uh, Edison wasn't sure what it was, but the theory is that it's a badger. And so today we're going to look at the historical what if that could have been if Thomas Alva Edison had lost his life sitting on the cowcatcher of a train thanks to a flying badger. Chris, beside the episode, the first episode that you and I ever did together where we had uh, one Annie Oakley shooting <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the leader of a, uh, of, of, a, of, of a European nation on the rise, shooting the Kaiser, this may be the bizarre start that we've ever had as our point of departure in a fork in time history. Um, we haven't done a cherries and cream episode. At some point, we might want to. So let's keep that open for ourselves. Okay, so there's a, there's a tease for an episode to come someday. If you know what that is, you'll be excited. If you don't, that's a reason to tune in, right? So our point of departure here is, a, is an Edison in his 30s. So this is before a number of the most notable inventions that we credit him with uh, come to be established in his name. We're going to spend some a little bit of time, I know, talking about that. Uh, so this is before all of that. So we're going to have a world where there's no Edison to invent, among other things. Probably the number one thing he's credited with is the light bulb. There's no Edison to invent the phonograph. Uh, there's no Edison to be involved in the early uh, mechanisms that will become motion pictures, as we know. This is all before that. So our point of departure is there's no Edison around to do all those things that we credit him with today. So uh, stick with us. I think this is going to be a fun one. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But let's talk about the what did. So just quickly, guys, when we say Edison, what's, what pops into your head? What do we think most of our listeners probably know about him or believe they know about him? What is, what is Edison's claim to fame, Robert? He invented practically anything and everything electrical. So much so that the original name of General Electric was Edison Electric Company, which right. is actually one of the 30 stocks that began the Dow Industrial that has stayed on the Dow Industrial all those years. Yep. So, you know, there, there's a throw out, not to mention he, he invented, like you said, Don, the light bulb, the phonograph, many, many others. One of the big things he did that not a lot of people think about, and I think this is one, one area I want to explore a little bit as we think through the fork, he invented what we think of as your corporate research and development divisions as far as how it worked. The, the reality of it is, when most people hear Edison, they think of this guy in a laboratory working late hours at night by himself with candlelight before he has electric light, you know, and or gas light, and he's doing this all by himself. And that is nowhere near the part how Edison invented really anything. Edison had at one point thousands of people working for him in a sprawling complex. And they're doing a lot of the inventing and working and doing things and bringing it to him and saying, what do you think? Now, every now and then, you know, he may be walking by the floor and say, hey, try that. But the reality of it is most of his inventions are, A, like you mentioned before, Don, there's other people working on them at the same time. But B, it's all his assistants doing everything. And he had employment contracts written to the point that in reality, Anything they they invented, he owned the patent for, and his company owned the intellectual property. So in essence, he sets up not only how research and divisions are founded, research and development divisions that companies get founded, but he sets up how intellectual property law works in that I write training for a living. I cannot take any training I write because I have always I've not ever been an independent contractor. I have always worked for a company. I can't take my training and take it other places that I've developed because intellectually the company owns that training. And so your work product, which mm -hmm. comes out of your intellect, is the property of someone else as a result of you entered into that voluntarily. It's the result of a right, contract. Right. No, yeah, you yeah. But you no longer own the rights to your own intellectual output in that certain context. Correct. Yeah. And I know from a lot of the work that I've done in the business jobs that I've had and the roles that I've had, a common thing that we would look at in contract review is along that same thing. You know, when, when, when we would go to work as a contractor for someone else or that type of thing, you know, IP rights, who 
how inter intellectual property is protected is important. And then, you know, how confidential information around intellectual property is important. But then also if something is innovated, you know, for example, you innovate for that individual client or that client brings an innovation to you who owns that idea. So to your point, Robert, we're still living with Edison's coattails 150 years after he began active work as an inventor because of what he set up there. And I, I'd, uh, I'd even but, say he shouldn't be, I, I, I don't know if we should think of him as an inventor. He's a businessman. Yeah. He, you know, as we said, there's other people working on this stuff. Some things, there are other people that beat him to certain things, but he's the promoter. He's the, litigious person he's the one that enforces those intellectual properties in a business mindset more than just the pure tinkerer the the, the tinkerer of menlo park or or what, whatever of wi menlo wi park wi wizard of menlo wait park. yes yeah which, which, which i think is an excellent point and I, I bring that up because it even suggests more like like he was I'm not saying he was an intelligent guy I'm not saying he wasn't creative guy i'm not saying that he didn't have you know, um, an entrepreneurial slash inventor spirit too. I don't want to discredit him. There's a reason Edison is Edison, but you know, this, the, I think Robert sort of painted the picture of, you got this, this picture of one guy sort of in this massive garage at Menlo park and he's doing all the output. You got the wrong picture about what was going on, particularly in the later years at Menlo park, when a lot of these things are being churned out by the, by the Edison Menlo Park machine, so to speak, the invention machine, the laboratory. The laboratory that he's set up is not just one guy in a lab, you know, doing stuff. And, you know, so some of the people that worked for him are names that you would recognize. We talked about this uh, pre-podcast a little bit, but, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, people who worked for Edison include guys like, uh, well, Nikola Tesla, is the one that immediately comes to mind for me because so much of what's associated with Edison is around electricity. I know we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm just looking through the list here. Henry Ford worked for Edison. Um, just, you know, Others here on the list that's in front of me now, uh, some of them I recognize, some of them are probably more well-known in other, other areas. There's chemists here. Uh, there's obviously folks that worked around uh, um, um, other parts of science like you know, what, around the light bulb and around electricity. But, you know, literally on the Wikipedia page here, there's a list of about 25 people of note that worked for Edison. And that's not even an exhaustive list. And there's 10,093 patents that were issued to Edison. And so um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that. What, what else should we hit on the, the Edison that was before we talk about the Edison that wasn't, guys? Well, at the end of his life, him and Ford and Firestone became good friends and went auto camping together every year, which I find that incredibly intriguing. Yeah. With Ford having been one of his guys bringing the popularity, at least of the automobile into play in order to be able to do that. So I'm going to suggest if you guys disagree with this, I want to get this sort of our agreement, disagree with this out of the way on the front end. I generally believe that without Edison, in the big picture, almost everything we have technology that's credited to Edison still comes into being. It's this idea of there in most of these things, like a lot of invention, there's multiple people working on it at the same time. Sometimes somebody just wins the race and sometimes by a little bit or sometimes they just win the race to the patent office, even if they didn't win the race to actually producing it in the lab. And so I would be, I would argue, but if you guys disagree or want, we want to have a conversation about that, I'd like to do it here on the front end. I think that there's nothing that we credit to Edison that doesn't come into existence. It's not like we would be doing this podcast somehow today by, by gaslight and, I don't know, transcribing it on to vellum and then circulating it around the country or something because technology just doesn't exist without us. And I, I believe that anything of note, including the light bulb fact, there's a lot of things talked about, you know, the other people that had had light bulbs or the concept there that was going on at the same time, that, that removing Edison does not change the scientific invention part. Can we agree upon that? Is there any point of disagreement you guys would like to raise on that? Just to sort of get that out of the way before we start talking, I think about the bigger impacts. I can't, I can't think of anything that wouldn't have existed if he hadn't have been working on it. If, if he had not been around, I think we'd have ended up pretty much with the same things. Chris? 
The only thing I'm going to put a fine point on is this. Timing and sequence. Uh, Harkening back to another episode we did, this might have been my second episode, um, on a delay in research on the Manhattan Project. For certain things, the timing matters. Uh So we're 120, 130, 140 years out from some of this research. Yes, everything has happened by now. But things may not have... Other exogenous factors may be happening without his technology... You understand that, yeah. And I think that's an important point. But you know, would we ha- would we not have anything major that we that we have today? I think the answer is no. But would there potentially be an impact on history, even you know, because because of timing or because of even sequencing? It's not just when it happened, but in what order certain things happen. Because when you're talking about innovation, I think it's a really important point, Chris. And it's it's tough to sort of it'd be tough to deconstruct these unless we spend an entire, you know, series of episodes, hundreds of them probably you could do this with about because this innovation comes along another innovation, which was equally valid before they both come along gets stymied because it's viewed as being the inferior to what actually came forward. And so as a result of that, all of this innovation can happen, but the sequencing and the uh, and the timing on it can change how it plays out over you know plays out over history. And the who does it and where they do it does make a difference. I think in the macro uh, historical sense, for example, you know if I if I say Motown, you're thinking Detroit. It's not called Motown because of. The fact that it's destroyed because it's the the automobile industry. You know, it's Motown because of motor companies. Well, you know, if it's somebody other than Ford or somebody else who comes along because of the sequence here, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we're calling. I don't even know where it would be. Well, I don't know who, who else. It, somebody else. You talked Motown. about the friendship between Ford and Firestone. We could be talking about Akron, Ohio as Motown. Right. Exactly. Because that was a huge tire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, again, I think we get the same things to your point, Chris, maybe not in the same order. And maybe the timing does matter because it has impact on other events in the timing that it does. Uh, but those are tougher to theorize in a fork, I think, in terms of understanding how they would interplay. And I think, generally speaking, my broad take on this, not to take away from what Chris just says, I think it's an important point, what Robert said as well. I think this is one of those, when you exit off, when you take the fork, you end up back on the same road. Eventual, you, eventually, it's just you, you took a different route to get there. One one, one invention, let's just speak of, as I, as I was sitting there thinking through things, do we ever execute people by electricity? Well, that, that's a good example, but I think that's a, a place maybe to jump off into what I think is the larger impact of not having Edison, if we've agreed with what I talked about, with Chris's important asterisk or caveat to understand how that, that can play through. But you, what you just raised there, Robert, is not Edison the inventor. What you raised there is Edison the business guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Edison the business guy, that's a whole other animal. It amazes me when I've when I've seen documentaries about Edison or when I've read stuff like I was doing today when you know we were talking about this topic. Um, what's the best word? I, aggressive, aggressive is probably the kindest word that I can think of to describe Edison as a business guy. He was, you might even say, dirty <laughs> in, in other um, contexts. He, he would have made Gordon Gecko. There you go, Chris. He, he, he would have made Gordon Gecko look like a. Uh, upright standing member of the community (laughs) yes so let's go down robert's thing here so edison one of the things that edison is known for in in the real timeline is the invention of the of the light bulb right well there's a fundamental problem with having a light bulb what is the fundamental problem with having a light bulb versus the other modes of lighting guys it requires this thing called electricity (laughs) yeah which you might derive from a battery depending on how you might generate that, you know, a chemical battery, which, you know, Edison has some patents when it comes to batteries as well. But ultimately what you quickly realize you need is some distributed way of producing and getting electricity to these things. And by the way, 
the lighting that was being replaced, you mentioned this earlier, sort of gas light, lamp light, had distribution systems because you were you were simply moving the, the natural gas or the other fuels that were doing that through there. So the realization was you needed to have some electricity distribution mechanism to make this light bulb something that's going to really, you know, the light bulb is great. It's not what it is today. GE is not what it is today if you have no way of power of getting power to that bulb. So, Robert, I'll let you discuss a little bit. What was what was Edison an advocate for in the what's been called the war of the currents? So Edison wanted direct current and direct current and alternating current. And it has been years since I studied this in physics. I will freely admit that <laughs> operate similarly, but differently. Um, and so he was a idea of direct current. And the biggest difference was so if you had direct current, let's see. Right now, Don, Don and I, we're what, 30, 45, 45 miles away from each other, Don, roughly? Probably. Robert's much Somewhere. further. I mean, Chris is much further. Yeah, Chris is much further. But but Don and I, there is a pretty decent chance that Don and I are both obtaining our power through an alternating current method, delivery method, from the same power source. Or, or, or generate, we could be sharing the same generation point. Yes. Essentially, based on how the grid Correct. is functioning at this moment in time. It's right. It, right. There, it, it, there, it, it's a geographic fact. I'm pretty sure I'm not on the same one you guys. Well, I'm, it's not more than a geographic fact, but that is a true statement. <laughs> but, but yeah. Because mine works in 20 degree weather. Well, there you yeah. go. Well, there's that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, we could be sharing the same. If you had a direct current system, basically my little small neighborhood of roughly a thousand homes would probably have about 10 generators in it. As, as I understand it, the first kind of scale yeah. implementation of this had a generator for a three or four block area. Yeah, yeah. And, that, that, and, the, and the limitation on direct current is how far, because it's, it's, it's the, how far the current travels in one direction, distance is a factor in well, it's because the amount- it's, it what, has what been distributed and where it can get to it what degree, yeah. right? It's a, it's a current loss thing. Yeah. Right. Imagine you're shooting like water through a hose. If the hose has holes in it, by the time it gets 30, 40 miles, like you were saying, there's no pressure behind it. So Edison is an advocate for this, a huge advocate for this. He, he, he thinks even, it's safer. That, and, and, and it can be and it can be argued that it might be in the sense that you know i've touched a nine bolt battery to my uh to my tongue and you know gotten a little jolt out of that that's a direct uh, granted a small but that's direct current that's doing that uh i i actually had to do a wiring repair at my house yesterday i flipped the breaker off because i didn't want to mess with the one the 110 that was flowing to to the to the light that i was having to make sure a wire was properly tightened on so the other alternative thing was this thing called alternating current, which, by the way, one of uh, as Edison's protégés, Tesla, was a, was a big advocate for. And Tesla leaves. Tesla ends up hooking up with this guy named, you may have heard of him, Westinghouse. Uh, and so they are an advocate for during this War of the Currents, which is, a, which is an incredibly interesting story. I've seen a number of documentaries. I remember a PBS documentary in particular here. And alternating current uses a different mode of transmitting the current and the current flows in multiple directions and thus is capable of being transmitted over a much farther distance without what Chris described as the hole in the water hose problem about what you lose. Uh, it, it's not a 100% solution in terms of how far and how much power you can send, but is much more capable of sending larger amounts of power over a greater distance distributing to a larger network. So the, these two guys, Edison and his direct current advocates and Westinghouse and the alternating current uh, are competing during the war of the currents over what, because eventually one standard has to be decided here too. That's the other thing, right? That's the other, I think, interesting side note of this whole discussion. And so in doing that, um, this was VHS and beta before VHS and beta. Yeah, uh, or, although although more of a difference, say, although more of a difference probably between the quality of the two things that were going yes. on. Yes, or, or more a Blu-ray and an HD DVD. Ah, uh, yes, okay, I'll, 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 I'll buy that. And so, to your point, you said there at least might be one elephant that would still be alive, right, Robert? Because uh, <laughs> Chris threw that out, but yes. Yeah. 
so so Chris, so Chris, tell that tell that story because uh, you're you're the one you're the one that actually named the elephant because I didn't know the elephant. So the the this is another I guess hat that we could assign to um, Edison, and it does kind of go hand in hand. Oftentimes, when we think about businessmen, um, there was an elephant at the Brooklyn Zoo uh, that had gotten loose a couple of times, and you know, was walking around the city causing havoc. And Edison decided to basically make a show of electrocuting Topsy the elephant. And there is actually video footage from one of his inventions of another of his inventions electrocuting an elephant. And he did this and he also... The other story being he built, and, and I think Robert is the one that touched on this, electrocution. He built electric execution devices, but he built them using alternating current. N not his mode of transmission. What he was actually trying to do was say, this other mode is less safe than mine. Let me show you. Uh, we're going to, we're going to deal with this elephant and elephant. And then as I understand the story and what I read today reinforces this, he convinced, I guess it was the New York legislature uh -huh. and they uh -huh. brought, um, we're looking for a mo more humane mean, quote unquote, humane means of capital punishment. That's a whole other discussion we could have for a whole other day, but he convinces them to actually adopt the electric chair electrocution as the mode of doing that. And again, the electricity is being delivered by alternating current, which is his competitor's current. Edison was not in the business here of trying to sell electric chairs, or else he would have had them powered by his own DC, because that would have been the, the business model to follow if that's what you were about. He was actually using them as a demonstration of why his technology was safer than his competitions. Yeah, well, and, and it's funny because what he actually did is his electric company went and bought some Westinghouse AC dynamos that were being retired to hook up to the electric chair that he built for the demo so that Westinghouse's items would be, this is that assertiveness that we talked <laughs> about him in the, so, so that he could push it. You know, electrical execution has performed by Westinghouse Dynamo, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of set up. I was actually in my head trying to run through like what a modern equivalent of that would be where you use the particular the potential deadly aspects of your competitor's product as a way to promote your own product indirectly by showing what's unsafe about theirs. And I came across a couple of them, but I don't know if I came up with any good ones when I was doing that. To me. I, but, but Chris is nodding. Maybe he's got one. Yeah, I feel like a good example of, of something in our world would be something we've touched a little bit on currently is the battle of the um, mobile operating systems and bringing an, I, I can just picture the turtleneck bringing an Android device up on stage and crashing it to show how unreliable the other people's technology or hacking it or things like that, because that is a some what similar uh, duopoly that there's two right incompatible technologies. Um, I will even concede that on a technological basis, there are there is less difference between the two mobile operating systems than like we were saying. DC, like we're not going to have coal power plants, oil power plants on every block. Yeah, I, I, I think the one that jumps into my head there along the same lines, Chris, I think you're in the vein that I thought of was imagine this is back before things got more sophisticated and the Apple computer environment uh, became much more of a target for vi computer viruses. You know, there was a period of time when PCs were the unsafe exposed to the computer virus world. Mm -hmm. And there was something magical about the Mac and you know, the Mac, the Apple operating system. Now that had to do surely with the fact of if you're going to write computer viruses, you write them to do the most damage possible. So you write to the largest market penetration, among other things, but also closed or, systems, closed systems versus open systems too is the other part of the equation. Or, or target people that have real jobs. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, see, see, you knew something was coming. You yes, knew one of those was coming. See, see at least one previous episode of the room where it happened. I think it's called Three Old Men and Brody, where we, we talk a little bit about this. We're talking about the the Apple Garage, you know, sort of being the place that things were done. But it, and again, we may have gotten a little bit of a field here, except to say if there's no Edison to do that, you know, where and by the way. That was not successful. In the end, alternating current became uh, what the system is built upon, primarily because it was the it was the technology that was going to solve the problem better than direct current was in in in, in the technology that existed at the time. Um, and then you know they they win the uh, they win the Westinghouse wins a World Fair, you know, showing off the power of this in the late nineteenth century, and then the first power station that goes in at Niagara Falls. Alternating current enables them to actually power Buffalo, which is what thirty miles, thirty-five miles away. They're able to transmit the power to that distance and, and make it work. And that World's Fair actually is one of the things I was thinking about when I was making the point about sequences of discoveries. That World's Fair may not have been able to be powered. It may have been the St. Louis Fair later on, or or it may not have even been in the United States, but th- right. something like that. Right. And and so to Robert's point in bringing this up, you know, if we take Edison out of the equation, thank you, Mr. Badger, in, in Edison's early 30s, uh, if we take Edison out of the equation, first of all, uh, <laughs> this has become a recurrent theme for me. He's not joining us tonight for the recording, but I'm thinking about Eric Rush. He mentioned before in episode one human up. We're one elephant up at a minimum under this scenario. If a, we're one badger down, but we're probably at least one elephant up for a period of time if, if there's no Edison. But, you know, does to your point, Chris, does the, the first of all, is there even a war of the currents in the, in the sense that we see? Uh, could it have been somebody else who would have been coming with a different technology reporting something else? And could we have a very different way that at least or, those, the early electric grid mm-hmm. came to be in the United States? Or would AC and its advantages have gotten big first and DC is just not even not an even issue. The- and then here's another thing to throw out there. If we don't have the battle of the currents, what does Australia's most famous rock and roll band name itself? All I can say about that, Chris, <laughs> is I sit here, I sit here thunderstruck by the thought. That's all I can say about that. So I, I want to explore a little bit more because I think, Robert, you brought up in our in our discussion pre-recording, to me, the most fascinating part of this. I think in the end, AC would have won out just because it was the more logical technology. Who would have done it or how it would, it would have been. done? It would have went faster. Yeah. I, uh, I think the, it was slowed down by Edison because I, 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 of being I think that's Edison. a fair place to go. Yeah. I mean, Edison, Edison had sway, right? So if Edison is the one who's not just electrocuting elephants, but, uh, but, you know, and, and building electric chairs, if he's, if, if he's not standing against it, it probably is a more logical thing. Oh, this is the perfectly logical way to do this. Um, I'm more intrigued by the thing that Robert brought up. That's the place I'd like for us to spend a little bit more time. This idea of how R and D structures were put into place by, by Edison. And then there's, there's one other sort of sidelight to this. I know that we'll get over to, cause it's the other thing. I think that's the more notable thing that we may feel the difference of today that would be without us. And so Robert, do you, do you think we didn't talk about this off podcast? Do you think it's inevitable that something like Edison's model would have come into being, or is that, is, is that really a force of, of Edison's business acumen that causes that to be? Potentially. I I'd need, I haven't thought about if Westinghouse had done anything like this. And if he did, did he base it on what he saw from Edison? I think R&D itself would have developed out because somebody would have figured out, hey, let's put a bunch of minds together in one place to come up with a problem and solve it. And it makes much more sense. I'm not so sure intellectual property follows the same pattern because I'm not sure everybody gets as ruthless as he is with patents. And, I think it does. And yep. and, and okay. I'm thinking specifically about a lot of what happens around this time with Supreme Court jurisprudence, where it, it may have become a quote nowadays, but corporations are people too. And that was definitely something that was very much a point made by the legal people making these decisions around then and 
if it's not in the electrical field, it's Firestone in vulcanization or it's somebody else in because it, it kind of feels like Edison is looked at as an earlier version of an inventor, the tinkerer in his garage, while at the point they're at, this is kind of a tipping point where you need this, you need the research model that you talked about of modern R&D. You need the amount of capital behind it. You need economic capital. You need the human capital of getting these people together and having significant research facilities because some genius in their barn can't keep up anymore. Well, yeah, and it, it goes back to one of the, I think it was second or third room where it happened podcast that we did kind of plug our other show a little bit where we talk about the, uh, the garage and, mm-hmm. You yeah, know. Well, and how that you know how ultimately there you had whether it was you know whether it was Hewlett and Packard <laughs> or whether it's you know it, it's a couple of guys named named Steve or you know whether it's uh, you know a Bill Gates or whatever it might be you know sort of that Silicon Valley sort of way of doing things. Um, to your point, Chris, the ideas are great, but somebody's got to take that idea and turn it into something that becomes and that becomes viable in terms of being grown you know, and, 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 and sold. And, and, and it's, it's interesting to think about that mythology and how important that has become to us because I don't know about your garages. No garage I've ever been in would work as a clean room to actually <laughs> manufacture microchips. Those were manufactured somewhere and they, you know, Jobs and Wozniak did their thing with them, put them together in a unique combination. But the technology to produce that their inputs is not something you can do at at their level. There, there's a whole, there's a whole thing. There's a whole series of topics. I think it's a whole podcast that somebody ought to jump on. We have two already, so it's not going to be me. But uh, in, in my mind, I call these the American mythologies. We have so many of these things that we sort of hold to as if they're true. They're, they're, they're mythology in the sense they're maybe based in some truth, but they become legend very quickly. Like you said, you know, they're not building. They're not building computers in the garage there even even the homebrew computer market that they were you know dealing with there th- those chips were not being made there yeah you were putting things together there you were taking components and combining them you're writing some code maybe you're you know building some operating systems that kind of thing but you're right the, no, no garage i've ever seen qualifies as a clean room to do the types of things that you do need to do there or you know another example of this is you know you know robert hit it on the head you know, I think when we learn about Edison in school, we think about, you know, this guy that's out there in his barn who's, you know, having eureka moments left and right. And that's that's not really true. I mean, in, in the long run, it's not true. Maybe there's instances of that early on, but that's not what it becomes. While most of the things we're talking about here that he's credited with are being cranked out. Uh, I would argue the very last true invented in my garage type deal maybe was the Apple computer. I don't know if you've had one since then, unless you want to consider Facebook, but that's a whole other conversation. I, I actually think almost that personal computers and what you were saying about the new importance of intellectual property as opposed to a physical economy thing actually makes invented in my garage easier because you can do professional level cutting edge stuff from your garage in the intellectual property mindset of you can make an app from your garage. You can make an app from us from anywhere. So, and, and if that's, (laughs) why don't you do that? And and so it becomes, you know, really it's not even so much the garage, it's the dorm room or Mm -hmm. it's, or, you know, you know, or it's Bezos, you know, I guess there's a little bit of a garage mythos around Amazon to a degree, but really, you know, the same type of thing that's there, but, you know, again, this, you know, this idea of what we credit Edison with, which I think was your argument was Chris, this was going to happen because the economic forces of the day, what was needed in terms of, of financial capital, what was needed in terms of human capital necessitated that you weren't going to quote unquote mom and pop this stuff in the late 19th century and have it go anywhere. Right. Right. And, and, and there's one more thing 
that legal framework of intellectual property rights, that was going to be very important as well. Yeah. And, you know, that, so that later becomes, you know, trademarks and other things that companies do to protect, you know, their interests. You know, the thing that just popped into my head, which was really bizarre, there is even the idea of something totally, you know, as far as I know, Edison never did anything in the pharmaceutical realm, but, you know, how the pharmaceutical industry works, you know. The, those chemicals exist out in nature, but putting those chemicals together in that way, producing that thing, that's the IP, and that's what you're able to protect for a period of time before you can make that drug as a generic drug. It has its it has its protected period as you know as a as a protected pharmaceutical development research and development produced that allow you your rights to a certain amount of profits in a way for a period of time you wouldn't have any other way. There's there's one other kind of a. I, I, I will admit I am unsure about how accurate this story is, but Robert was mentioning earlier that he's always been in the professional training world. He's developed trainings, and he cannot – since he's been on this podcast, he has changed jobs. Uh-huh. He cannot use previous trainings at his new jobs. Um, There's one thing I took with me from my previous company to my new company, only because we never adopted it, and never rolled it out, and never mm-hmm. branded it. <laughs> there's, there's, I, I think you guys have probably heard of the the absurdity of the idea of subway sandwich artist. H- have you heard of this one? This was that, uh, I, I've heard the term, so I know the term. Robert, do you want to pick it up? Or, or, do, I don't. I just know the term. It's it's. The guys that make the subway sandwiches tried to claim themselves to be artists at one point. The not the opposite. The subway franchisee corporation claimed that the making of sandwiches their way is an intellectual property and tried to apply non-competes to sandwich makers so they could not take the secret sauce of their sandwiches and apply them at Wendy's or Quiznos or any other place that comes to mind that serves things between pieces of bread. Given that this has a New Jersey flair because of Edison, it seems to me that Jersey Mike's would be the, uh, would be, would be the place that we would need to go in, in the sandwich battle here. Yeah. And again, you know, this may seem a little esoteric for us as a topic for the podcast here, but the, the thing that sort of resonated with me when I was thinking about this as a topic and suggested it is we take what happened with Edison living and being there and what happened there is well, that's just the way it, it was and the way that it was always going to be. And I think very often when we go through an episode here on a fork in time, the thing that Alexis and I discovered very early on was we would constantly run these things up. You would run, you would run the fork for a little ways. Then you realize it comes back to the main road. It was like, it was more of a detour than a fork. You know, it, it, and the first thing that came into my mind was, is, you know, if you lose Edison because of the idea of, you know, uh, multiple developers, multiple inventions, simultaneous development, which we know is there's tons of examples of this throughout history, not just with the things that Edison did. But, you know, again, it's not like we're not going to get something that we have. Chris is very important point being made about sequence sometimes matters and timing can make a difference. So immediately I thought, well, you know, nothing really changes. And it wasn't until we were pre-recording and talking about that Robert said, but what about this? You know, this idea of, of the lab. And I think that could be different. Although, Chris, you make a compelling case for why that was probably yeah. also inevitable, just in a different form because of the what was going on with legal challenges. And it's not like there weren't other um economic institutions see the railroads see the oil companies at that time who weren't doing similar things to protect every interest that they had in every possible way that they could i think edison just ended up being the most ruthless about ruthless yeah about and, 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 in, and in the right place at the right time and and also maybe even i don't know you know i don't know enough about what's unique about state law here versus federal law you know especially when it comes to patents and all that but uh New Jersey was probably a pretty good place to do some of that stuff in, in terms of the legal framework that existed there. Probably, you know, gave gave some gave some advantages to an Edison that an that another state might not have offered Edison. Which, which leads to the other thing that I think is an interesting point of departure. 
potentially if Edison gets, you know, killed by a flying badger. Again, just the concept of that in my head. I can't get this image out of my head about what causes our fork here is um, the Academy Awards live from Hackensack, live from Menlo, New Jersey. You know, do we have, you know, Chris, I know you know this story a little bit. You've alluded to it in other conversations we've had. Uh, Eric Bond, I guess, on one episode, we talked a little bit about this as well. Why in the world is Hollywood Hollywood? Well, it has a little bit to do with one Thomas Alva Edison, right? Right. And, and, and this might be another interesting difference, which is Edison, because he did stumble upon that R&D model, was able to concentrate a lot of discoveries. So if we think about – so let me take a pause. Um, and do the what did happen, he, Edison, quote, air quotes here, invented motion pictures, and he aggressively maintained his property, his intellectual rights on motion picture cameras and the production of movies. And Hollywood developed to some extent the motion picture industry developed in los angeles because it is geographically as far away from new jersey as you can get we hadn't annexed hawaii yet uh, and it was literally they went to the west coast to hide out from edison's lawyers where they could skirt some of these copyrights and develop their own thing without outside of the watchful eye i guess is the best way of putting it out, out of sight not front in mind therefore not producing court case to try to enforce and, and, something and that's this, going on right and this one of the interesting things i'm thinking about now is if it hadn't have been for edison's earlier successes he may not have the resources or better yet, the person that does develop motion pictures may not have had these earlier successes and had the economic resources to have lawyers on retainer to actually enforce this. So two 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 things. Yeah. So so one thing, one of the earliest motion pictures developed outside of like horses and gymnasts to, to demonstrate the technology. It's actually a film that existed the 1900 hurricane aftermath of Galva that hit Galveston. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And and the second part of that is, as you're thinking through, Edison hated talking movies. He thought it ruined acting at the time. And, and that's actually one of the things I was thinking about when I was talking about sequencing. It developed in Los Angeles when it did. If, for example, the sequencing is different, maybe it's in a Galveston or a Houston area because of cheap land, relatively, you know, 360-ish filming days available. Um, as another thought, why not even uh, another city in California that suffers a natural disaster about this time. 1906 in San Francisco. 1906, yeah. Where you, you know, how much of our mythology of Hollywood has to do with the gold rush going to California to make it rich? San Francisco is where that happens. So again, if, if A, the motion picture industry is shifted around and is making his decision to get out of the New York area at a different point. Maybe they pick a different source or possibly if it's not, if so much of these inventions and these patents aren't centralized, somebody is going to come up with motion pictures, but maybe they're not going to have patents on light bulbs, on electric transmission, on all of these other things and have all of these resources to enforce their copyrights or frankly to, you know, 
the way they enforce their copyrights are different. Maybe they're a little more open to licensing it to people right. that are willing to pay for it and not drive the motion picture industry away. Yeah. I, I, that was the other thing that popped into my head. I, you, you were going there, you get, you got there a little bit ahead of me, Chris, in the sense of, you know, there probably still is a, there's a business model that gets formed, but maybe it's a different business model that happens, a franchise model or a, you know, or, or again, the delay here, if it's not, you know, if Edison doesn't have the the laboratory that's doing these types of things, I know there's a lot of stuff going on on the continent. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening in France, for example, with this technology. You know, maybe it's, you know, it's the United States importing <laughs> French technology to do these things versus, you know, their homegrown versions of it that were competing against what was coming over from Europe at the time that, you know, was a similar, uh, you know, s- similar ability to do things, just do it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, a side note here, just to throw it out there because it popped up in the research. So you've probably heard this, you know, uh, Edison and Bell were both working on the thing that we sort of know to become the telephone. This is actually a case of where somebody other than Edison sort of, you know, beat the one won the patent war here. But in Edison's version of phones, as we would know them now, you would not answer hello. Apparently, he, he was an advocate for you would answer Ahoy. So, you know, that, that, that's another thing that, uh, you know, at, 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 I guess in either case, this was Edison surviving didn't matter, but we, we avoided answering our phone calls with Ahoy. So there you go. There's something to be said for that. There's something usually to be said for that. I, I think so too. <laughs> All right. Did we miss anything big here, guys? I mean, I know we may have gone a little shallow here and a little wide here. Do we miss anything that's just, you know, that's out there that's probably worthy of mention? There is one thing that I just find a unique irony, and and I laugh at it. Um, you've talked a little bit about, and and we've talked a little bit about a modern entrepreneur who's very much in kind of this uh, Edison mold of an Elon Musk. And what is the name of his car company? It's Tesla. Tesla. And yet, what is the major electrical current? What is the research that he's doing on these cars? It's battery. It's DC technology. Yeah. Well, and and, and not not only that, but uh, you know the other the other big place that um, Musk's footprint is in, is in solar. And battery and battery te- and that's because mm-hmm. of battery technology, by the way, the ability to take solar energy and actually store it in a meaningful way. And, and so it is that case of maybe Edison was right. He was just right a hundred years early in terms of the technology, or because of AC being what it was in terms of centralizing generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, as being the model that we have now. So the reason you have to have a grid is you have to have a place to, to, that you're transporting this centralized generation across. This um, might be the ultimate story of what I was saying about sequence mattering, because while you can't have a three mile island on every block, you certainly could have solar panels on the top of every building to have a more decentralized and a more localized power generation capacity. Yeah, and even one of the interesting things of uh, we're about two weeks post the the major land the, the major landfalling hurricane of the of the 2022 season that was Ian in Florida, and I actually saw a, a news story about a community that had been built there that was intentionally built around the concept of being uh, being better equipped to survive uh, an event like this. Part of that was how it was designed to deal with storm surge issues and some of the other things that are, this is one of those areas because of my past work life, I know a little bit more about than, you know, others do, but where this ties back to our discussion here was that was a small localized power distribution grid so that they were not as dependent upon the major things that could happen to the, to the grid as a whole, as a result of this event, thus they were more sustainable and resilient during an event because it was much more like you know robert was talking about there you know what would you have in your local neighborhood there of you know a thousand homes well you would have three or four but once you got that up and going and the distance of what you would have to hook back up is far less complex than the large grids that we have today that are often dependent upon each other in different ways to make that happen so i think that's an interesting point chris and the idea you know the irony again of you know nikola tesla is just one of the most fascinating 
figures of the last 200 years of history to me because there, there's so much there that we sort of know or that we sort of wonder about that we sort of think he's more as much legend as he is reality. Obviously, you know, a bright guy, obviously somebody that Musk uh, looks to or else he would not have made that choice. But you're right. It, it's the, and by the way, Tesla was an advocate for AC apparently back in those days and until he could transmit the power wirelessly, which apparently he was working on. We don't know how far he got with that, but he was working on that is uh, it's sort of our, it's ironic. It is ironic. That, uh, that around the, you know 125 ish years later we've come back around full circle and now the names have changed to be applied to something else i i always just think it was probably just knowing the two people edison and tesla it probably was just easier to get to to name your company tesla than as as robert was saying there were already companies named edison so yep. i mean mm-hmm. you could probably just get the rights easier more than anything else and by the way, if you tried to name something at us and you didn't get uh, Thomas Alva's approval for it, you were going to get sued. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, it, you know, Tesla's just kind of out there doing his thing. And uh, he's not like that rolling in his grave if you name your company after him. Yeah, there you go. Good point. Uh, I, I, and I, I, somebody who likes and appreciates irony, uh, Chris, I always like it being pointed out, you know, that, that there there is irony there. And uh, for those of you, I think we will have talking again about what I sort of led the episode off with in our inspired by it in our in our in our podcast store. There will ultimately be the the Musk Bond bill and some type of of uh, of apparel or, or logo stuff that that's sold there because I know that that's how Chris thinks of Elon is you know he's he's he, he's like the cross between Edison and a Bond villain, right? Yeah, I I I I I actually got into a discussion with people on a commuter train um, that, yes, probably a couple of months afterwards was horribly shut down because it hit a deer, but that, that's, that's a different story, that maybe the idea of Bond villains was meant to condition you to think that these kind of eccentric geniuses coming in disrupting economic modalities are villains. secretly evil. Yes. Yeah, that they're villains. <laughs> Oh, there's a concept there too. All right. Anything else that we missed, guys? I, th- I think we pretty much covered because, like you said, I, I'm with you, Don. I, I don't think it's a fork as much as a a detour. Yeah, but but you see different things along the way when you take the detour. That's you know that was mm-hmm. I think the one one of the ways that Alexis described it to me once is yeah, but but didn't you see different things along the way? And the answer is yeah. You ended up in the same more or less the same place, but the journey was different along the way so sometimes you know it, it, it's it's the same it, it's the same but it's different all at the same time which is an interesting concept of of you know what goes on here well guys i appreciate you spending some time tonight i'm going to close out the show with a couple of reminders to our listeners uh within the next month we'll be coming back around at least for probably the second and third episodes in our installment of the series that we started off with Bo Breslin. We're due to, to get the, the next couple of recordings done on that. So if our listeners are going, hey, I really enjoyed those. Where's the rest of that? It's coming. Uh, we just have to coordinate the recording across the pond with uh, with Bo to make that happen effectively. So uh, that's in the works there as well. Uh, if you haven't gone there, I'm just going to put out the plug for it again. Uh, we have our, our uh, Discord uh, server that's out there now uh there'll be links in the show notes on how to get there a place to interact with our listeners i've i've, I've started really enjoying make at least a trip once a day over to the discord server to see if somebody's posted because we have our listeners posting feedback here on shows topical suggestions so if you want a way to interact you know we know the pod, podcasting is pretty much a one-way audio medium that's the nature of what it is but again, we've tried to build a community, and one of the ways the community can communicate directly with each other and not just with us is there at the Discord server. So if you haven't found us there, come and join us. Uh, I really enjoyed interacting with some of the listeners that I had interacted with by email there before. So I had the privilege of interacting with them, but not everybody had the privilege of interacting with them. And I think that's one of the advantages of that particular thing. I'm going to put out a very large output here. I want somebody from this community to come and take me on in the area of diplomacy online. You think you can manage the seven powers that are leading up to World War I better than they did? Come on and prove it. There's there's a place to do that in the online diplomacy community that we built. There's details, again, linked in the show notes and on the website for some games that are just for our listeners and just for our team that want to play there. 
uh, it, it's a, it's an interactive experience too, because that's a negotiation, the stuff that goes on there. We have to convince each other to do things. So it's another way to interact. So I just want to throw that out there. I've been playing a fair amount of diplomacy here of late, but I haven't been playing it with or against this community. And so I'm throwing down the gauntlet guys come, come and take me on. If you've thought about doing that. Now's the time and come and do it. Check it out in the, in the show notes. We did mention the, uh, the podcast store where we have some logo stuff. If you know, if, if you'd like to have a fork where it ha- a fork where it happened, that'd be a whole different thing. A fork in time or room where it happened, mug or a t-shirt or some of the things that are from our inspired by series, a uh, a um, a Bismarck face palming, you know, is one of the things that you can get. That's Chris's inspired by thing. Uh, come and check us out. There's again links in the show notes uh, for our site there at uh, I guess that's the site there at T Public now is where we are now where we're doing that. Some pretty cool stuff. Alexis got her room where it happened coffee tumbler in within the past week i got a chance to see it. it's quality stuff she loves it and uh so if you want to check some of that stuff out we really don't make money doing that it does help support the show but that's not what it's about and by the way the live stream discount code which will get you 10 percent off of anything is still active through the middle of um, middle to end of this month it has about two weeks left from the airing of this episode so it's not too late to take advantage of that promo code uh, other than that, we do invite you to the website. You can support us via Patreon, all the blah, 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 usable podcast stuff here. Uh, but again, most of all, we thank you for giving us the gift of your time and engaging with us here. So I'm going to go around really quick to see if Chris or Robert have any final comments before we throw it to a close. Robert, you have anything to share with the good listeners? I don't. I think this was an this was an interesting exercise to think through, you know, where we end up without Edison. Yeah. And again, the bizarre way that Edison dies here. That's what first oh, that's attra- just, Yeah, flying badger is just amazing. Yeah, th- th- that's what attracted me. I got to tell, say honestly, that's what attracted me to this topic, first of all, is I don't care where we go with this episode, but to start it with Edison dies by flying badger, that's worth something just right then in there. Chris, what do you have for the good people, if anything? The, the only thing I'm, I, it, it's literally going through my mind right now is a episode of The Big Bang Theory where Sheldon is tracking his family history to try and figure out how long he's going to live. And there is actually a member of his extended family that he wrote KBB beside killed by Badger. Yes, because he decided to go into a crawl space and fight a Badger with a broom. Yeah. Yeah, not, 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 not a good call. Not a good call. Uh, so so, so what, the, other, the other thing we've learned here, badgers are yeah. dangerous. That's the other thing we've learned in this. Episode. Can be. Can be dangerous. Can be. And, and again, from, the, from what you read, we're assuming it's a badger. It was a bear cub size thing. I have heard nothing that it's not a possum. Anything can- like that. We can neither confirm nor deny a raccoon. A it could have been a raccoon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could have been any any number of varmints. To borrow something that Eric Rush said, when we I think it was on our Eisenhower episode recently, you know, sort of sort of, sort of the, the the public service announcement here is: don't ride on the cow catcher of a train. That's that's sort of the yeah. public service announcement. Yeah. Here is uh, you know, there's there's good reasons to be inside the moving vehicle versus you know. I think the analogy that I used for this maybe off podcast was instead of pretending you're DiCaprio from Titanic on the front of the train, you know, screaming at the top of your lungs that you're uh, that you're king of the world, which I don't think Edison was doing. But there's some parallels here. That being said, if we again, if we think about sequencing, technically, DiCaprio was doing an Edison on the front of the train. So there you go. Well, and, and, and by the way, there's a whole I may if I can find it, I will put it in the show notes. There's I, I've seen a YouTube video that it's a longer one that does like 30 minutes or so, if I remember correctly, on why Titanic is a time travel movie. I'm just saying that's out there. OK, so again, we. I think we've stumbled down several interesting paths here along the detour, but uh, but good stuff. So, uh, Chris, uh, Robert, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks to our listeners for joining. Robert, I'm going to throw to I'm going to throw to Chris today. I threw to you, I think, last week when we were closing something out. So I'm going to throw to Chris today in Alexa's absence. We really like this idea of forks in time. And so, if you happen upon a fork in time, Chris, do we have any suggestions for our listeners? Take it. Take it. All right. Thanks, guys.
Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.